microphone. If you can maybe introduce yourself before, before putting questions or comments, please. Daniel Dayano with the Romanian Central Bank, a member of the board. I want to raise one issue and then make an observation on uh, the approach the discussion has been evolving up to now. Now, one question is, and, and Senor Cantera has emphasized it, in, in the banking union, unless we have uh, a collective deposit insurance scheme, then, then we have a huge issue. But both explicitly and implicitly, that's bring at the surface the issue of fiscal arrangements. <laughs> and that's the main stumbling block. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, if we, don't, if we don't solve it, I mean, it's, we'll continue with fragmentation, obviously. Now, Banco Espiritu, Banca Popolare, then the, the Italian solution, but, and, and, you, and you differentiated. You said, look, I mean, it's everybody was invited to participate in the scheme, in the Spanish scheme. But at the end of the day, the solution in Portugal was Portuguese. In, in, in Spain, it was Spanish. In Italy, it was Italian. And, and that's what matters. Now, let me, let me suggest for discussion, because it looks like in banking and finance, we are scrutinizing ourselves. It's like we have finance divorced from the rest of society, of economy. But let's change the perspective and say, look, there is technological change underway, enormous technological change, which creates losers and wi winners in society, I uh, among economies. Uh, then we have the low interest rate environment, which it's because of what, what's been going on in, in our economies. So probably I think the way the discussion should also evolve in the future is, I mean, let's take a look at what's happening in our economies and see to what extent finance, banking is responsive to what's happening in, in our society. Otherwise, I mean, it's like we are scrutinizing ourselves for our, own, uh, for our own sake, and then demanding from policymakers to do what they think is appropriate. Probably the perspective should be different. Thank you. Let me maybe collect a few more questions, and then we, we have a round. I have uh, Richard here, and then... Thank you. Um, Three questions directed specifically, though. One on organizational structure. Um, the Nordea structure is a, s is a single headquarters with uh, branches in the different the four different countries, right? Uh, Santander, on the other hand, um, has in the UK a fully fledged subsidiary. Yeah. Why? Why the difference? Uh, what's, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Second question is for Torsten, um, as opposed to the others in a sense, um, why don't the nine Eurozone countries go ahead and join the banking union? Uh, what, are the, what are the obstacles are there, and what are the prospects? And finally, resolution. Um, Andrea, you quoted, I guess it was Alka Kunich, about, um, what did you say, that um, resolution is for the few, not the many. Some of us think that the triage has not gone anywhere near far enough uh, and that resolution is still for the many if um, authorities are willing to face up to it. Uh, but will the national supervised supervisory authorities allow that in the end? David Estera from Management Investment. Two questions. The first one for Mr. Um, Thurston. Can you explain me how a bank like Popular, you said that Popular is the optimal uh, resolution. Uh, given the uh, 
uh, hundreds of lawsuits uh, the private sector filed, which didn't in Vicenza, Veneto, in many other cases, I'm surprised by your statement, simply by looking at the uh, objectivity of what has happened. And can you explain to me how a bank that on the 6th of May gets from the ECB and all the regulators a full hell of, uh, so a bill of full health, full pass, including stress test, which is one in a 200 years event, of plus 10 billion euro, and then within one month goes to minus 10. So there's a 20 billion swing. How can you say it's a perfect uh, solution? Because to me, it's shocking from a private sector perspective, yeah? Then the uh, second question, this is mainly for um, Andrea and Ria. Private sector, the SRB does not have any money, de facto. So what happens? Now, private sector will follow the SRB, and wherever they go, they will run. Because if called into action, for them it's very simple. They only have one solution, bail-in. So I think if the whole objective is to make the system stronger, you now have achieved the solution in reality, where as soon as they show up, private capital will run, and it will self-inflict a bank run. So are we sure? But the reality, we've achieved a better and stronger system because um, from our perspective, actually has made it worse. And Governor Sturnaras, and then I think we close because we are coming closer to the end of the panel, so please. Yes, good morning. Uh, Yanis Sturnaras, uh, Governor of the Bank of Greece. Um, uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank you for, for excellent presentations, uh, very useful. Uh, for the sake of uh, saving time, I would uh, address only two questions to Thorstein Beck and one question to Jose Antonio. Um, first of all, uh, um, you said that um, in 2015 there was a conflict of interest uh, for, for the ECB. What exactly do you mean and how do you perceive that? Second, uh, on Italian banks, okay, we all know that uh, some people have been dissatisfied that uh, the full BRRD has not been applied. But, you know, as ancient Greeks uh, used to say, everything should be applied in good measure. What would have happened if we had applied full BRRD to senior bondholders in Italy? Mm. Um, the question to Jose Antonio is that um, um, we we used to compare, we, we compare um, the um, rate of return on uh, assets and uh, equity between Eurozone banks and US banks. Um, the institutional environment and the way that the authorities intervene are vastly different. The, the, I, I have not seen any academic analysis uh, to what extent uh, this difference in uh, the rate of return um, is a function of uh, these differences in, uh, in, the, in, in the institutions. I will just say, say one example, not, not the segmentation, not which, which is um, well-established facts, but the, the Fed intervened and bought all the non-performing uh, mortgage loans from the um, uh, balance sheet of banks, and it, it put it on its own balance sheet. That, that has a huge influence on the rate of return on American banks. So to what extent do you think um, that uh, this is a main cause of the difference between the rate of return on American banks and, uh, and Eurozone banks? Thank you. Okay, thank you. There were many other questions, but we are running out of time, so I would uh, ask the speakers to be very fast in their responses, no more than two minutes each, so very concise. Please, Thorsten, you start first. Okay, great. Um, so. Banking union without debit deposit insurance, without funding mechanism, yet it's exactly the point um, I try to make. Um, ultimately, it is a political decision to move to that. Um, no, there are some actually people like Martin Sandbu from the Financial Times who think that uh, maybe a, a full-fledged banking union with a funding mechanism and risk the uh, um, shift, uh, no, risk, no, risk shifting, risk sharing system. Sorry, it's early for me. Um, is actually a substitute for a fiscal union. I think there is some vanity to this point, uh, although I haven't completely thought it through. Um, and yes, uh, the banking system is certainly, has to be certainly responsive to the real sector. That's the point I tried to make on my first slide, that it's, uh, it is about the beneficiaries of the financial system. It's not about the financial system per se. I mean, that's what we ultimately should care about. Um, 
If I understood you correctly, Richard, it's the, the non-Eurozone EU countries where they should join the banking union. Um, I think uh, it, it depends very much on the cross-border interlinkages. Uh, I mean, so the case uh, Sweden, um, um, uh, yeah, Sweden, for example, and partly maybe de Denmark, I think there, there might be a valid point for that, given the, the cross-border linkages, for example, uh, through Nordia. <laughs> but of course, there are also downsides especially or the risks especially if you go to a full-fledged banking union in terms of the funding and p potentially having access to uh, uh, credit lines from the ECB liquidity lines from the ECB if you are part of the banking union so I think that's it's it's not an easy thing um, um, but I think there's a there's a case to be made in some cases uh, to actually go this step um, on Banco Popular um, I talked specifically about the resolution. I did not talk about the run-up to the resolution. Okay, I talked about it the the weekend. I think it was a weekend solution where the bank was intervened and was sold off to uh, um, to to Santander. So I did not talk about any mistake that might have been made before. This, my 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 point was purely on the fact that it was resolved quickly without panic in the market, um, with no taxpayer um, uh, money. Um, and by the way, one in 200 years does not mean an event happens every 200 years. That's a kind of a, a mistaken uh, interpretation of statistic. It's just something that happens with a probability of uh, 0.5%. Um, so again, that's, uh, and uh, I mean, I think um, a bank resolution without any lawsuits, um, I would be a bit, that, that might, might, have, might be too good to be true. Um, the conflict of interest that I pointed out, um, I didn't talk about it uh, during the Greece crisis, uh, sorry, the Greek standoff in 2015. I didn't want to talk about it for the interest of time. I was just, just to mention it, so it's on the one hand, the ECB has the objective of monetary or financial stability and of maintaining the, the euro, which I think is also an um, uh, objective of the ECB, although it might not be formally there. On the other hand, it's a creditor of the, uh, the Greek government. Uh, and of course, it was also a creditor to the Greek banks, and there is some uh, conflict there. Um, on the um, Italian banks, actually, I perfectly agree with you. I don't think, um, uh, I mean, this is exactly the problem I pointed out. Um, applying a new regulatory framework without cleaning up the legacy problems first. And the legacy problems in this case were senior bondholders being retail, being, hang, having been missold um, uh, these, uh, these bonds. Uh, so I think that's, that's exactly the kind of the, um, I mean, again, there were political reasons for that, but kind of the, the wrong sequencing of uh, events um, where we should have cleaned up the, the legacy problems first, like it was, has, it was possible in the US, for example, and then put into place a new regulatory framework. So again, um, of course, it also shows that no regulatory framework is perfect. And yes, we should all apply to the rules. That goes to my German friends. But we also should apply to sensible rules. That's um, very important. Thanks. OK, very quickly. Uh, looking at ourselves, yes, we are uh, looking all the time at improving supply. And that's why I said in my conclusions that it's all about supply and demand. But let me, being in Frankfurt and being in this building, that I talk about you know, what the other side uh, we think could be uh, doing. Uh, but clearly, yes, we are all the time looking at how to improve the supply side of credit. I, I just put one example, uh, but we, we can definitely talk uh, a lot about that. Differences between SPE and MPE. We are a multiple point of entry bank. Uh, there are very few of those. We believe that having the capital distributed locally and trapped locally gives us the option to cut the ties with that in case there was a problem. That, there, there is a big argument about whether you know, that, that option can be executed, the cost of it being executed, etc., etc. But there's no doubt that we have that option. And that option is worth something. So far, TLAC and other uh, regulatory frameworks have not captured the value of that option, in our opinion, properly. We are working with the authorities, and we've had some meetings with the SRB to discuss that. They see the benefits of that. It's very difficult to quantify the benefits of having the capital distributed and distributed locally. So, and clearly, diversification of capital, particularly in the countries where we operate, which are Brazil, Chile, Argentina, US, Mexico, UK, Spain, Portugal, etc., clearly we think adds a lot of value. And I will let Heike uh, answer uh, the single point of entry branch model. Perhaps I take that and, and the explanation is actually exactly the same. 
we operate in one market, primarily Nordics, which is sort of, we consider that to be one single market. And since the establishment of Nordea, we have operated as one bank in that market. If we would have sort of, we would have operations in Brazil, we could perhaps then have a subsidiary there instead of a branch, but for us that sort of uh, source of, of economics of scale and sort of synergies that we can drive and run the bank as one bank. And that is the reason why the legal structure was not aligned with our operating model, where we have Nordic operations, not sort of operations in each and every Nordic country separately. Just one very quickly about US banks' profitability. When we compare return on tangible equity, which is, which is the measure that we should use, not return on equity, return on tangible equity, where you have Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, uh, are earning 12%. We also have 12% banks in Europe. Right? We are earning 12% return on tangible equity. So, so w there are uh, similar profitability levels. The difference is how quickly banks as a whole uh, uh, earned more than the cost of capital after the crisis hit. And on average, they uh, earned that level faster in the US than in, the U uh, that, that in Europe. There may be lots of explanations for that, the economy, uh, this one country, et cetera, et cetera. Other might be the, the, um, the way uh, policymakers responded to the crisis. Uh, relating to banking union and uh, common deposit guarantee scheme, I would uh, leave the audience with an idea I got from a senior central bank. He was saying, why not to build a common deposit guarantee scheme? system along the lines we have a resolution and a supervision so that uh, there will be a common deposit guarantee scheme and a system for banks which are directly supervised by the uh, ECB banking supervision which are directly handled by the single resolution board and then national banks would be in national schemes just leave that idea with you Okay, thank you very much. Let me say a few words. I mean, first of all, I know this is very difficult in terms of communication, but let me say once again that, let's say, stress tests do not give a clean bill of health to anybody. I mean, they're basically instruments for us in particular to disseminate information to investors, market participants on how the banks would fare with the same uh, uh, adverse scenario. Uh, and then it's something for the supervisors to work through. And to be honest, let's say Popular didn't fare as... Uh, a top-notch bank in the stress test. It was in the bottom of the distribution. Supervisory action was started on, 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 on after the stress test, and uh, there was a serious uh, liquidity problem that developed. Uh, on the SRB, let's say, first of all, the SRB has money. It has a re single resolution fund that should be uh, operated. Still little money, to be honest, and still segmented into national <coughs> compartments, but gradually should be up a common uh, uh, a common fund, and the, the key point is to create a backstop for that money uh, as soon as possible on these, uh, on these, I agree. But I see the point, but the other point is that uh, the resolution framework is not only, let's say, on managing the crisis, is on preparing for a crisis. So the, 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 the resolution planning phase should be the core business of the, uh, and the build up of uh, loss absorbing capacity should be the core business uh, of uh, uh, resolution authorities more than the, the management. So, I mean, again, it's an issue of uh, seeing whether the new system uh, could work and too much resolution. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, the point here is to understand what is the best way of managing a crisis with the, the least deployment of taxpayers' money and the smoothest outcome for, for the markets. I mean, that, I think, is the, is, the, is, the, is the question. And have we found the right balance here? I think that we need to take stock from the recent cases and come back uh, with, a, with, a, with an answer in, a, in a, ideal in a short time. So I'm sorry that we eat, ate up a bit of, uh, of, the, uh, of the coffee break, uh, but I think it was an interesting discussion. Let me thank all the panelists and you all for the questions. And sorry for those who couldn't uh, have their questions. Please.